Testing. 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 Okay. I think we're live. So we got the good microphone working again. Hopefully it doesn't cut out, but we will see. Let me know if it does. Uh, we got a question right off the bat. Interesting paper and some promising results. Can you comment on its applicability to code? Uh, how about I answer that at the end? Because as of right now, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, I still haven't even read the paper. So we got another paper for you guys today. We're going to be reading uh, this paper. It's got a very nice, catchy title, Unlimiformer, Unlimited Transformer. It's basically an uh, amalgamation of those two words. It says, long-range transformers with unlimited length input. Uh, coming out of Carnegie Mellon University, which is where I went to school, representing. And it's 2 of May, 2023, so a little bit older, a little bit, eight days old, but you know what? That's still pretty good. So, I don't know. Let's get right to it. There is a code base for this as well. Um seems so far from what I can tell pretty good MIT license not a huge amount of stars but it's there uh, we can probably check it out afterwards let me former dot pi run we'll see if it has it's actually useful this is I guess the person who wrote it okay let's look at this abstract transformer based models typically have a predefined bound to their input length yes Transformers, which are a, kind of the most prevalent model architecture nowadays. They're not just used in natural language and sequences, which is where they were originally devised, but they're now kind of everywhere, including vision and a bunch of other modalities. But they uh, only take a specific length sequence, uh, sometimes also called the context. In this work, we propose on Lemmy Former a general approach that can wrap any existing and pre-trained hello gracious evening it's morning for me this is the first things i this is what i do i wake up in the mornings and i do these streams but good evening to you uh any existing pre-trained encoder decoder transformer and offload the attention computation across all layers to a single k nearest neighbor index hmm okay this index can be kept on either the GPU or CPU memory and queried in sublinear time. Okay, so it's important to note here, right, that when you, inside your computer and inside any computer, there's actually, the memory is split in many different places, right? And one of the kind of first splits that you can think of is that there's memory inside the GPU, and then there's memory, uh, I wouldn't call it CPU memory, I would call it the memory on your motherboard, that's also called the RAM. But basically, when you're making a motherboard computer, let's see this, uh, PC motherboard. Uh, images. Yeah, so if you've built computers before, you kind of already know what, the, what this looks like. But inside a computer motherboard, you have, this is where your CPU goes, right? Then you have, uh, where is it? There is no RAM here, but... This is an old shitty one, so it was a terrible example. <laughs> but basically, you have sticks of RAM that you can put into the motherboard, right? And that would be your CPU, quote-unquote, memory, right? So here, DDR4, there's also DDR3. And if you're old enough, you can maybe remember beyond that. But I think at this point, DDR4 is pretty standard. And your GPU is going to fit into a PCIe slot like this, and your GPU is going to have memory in it itself. So there's a separation between the, the memory that largely is used by your CPU and that pretty much everything in your computer uses. That's called the RAM, the random access memory that fits into these DDR4 slot or DDR slots. And then you have the memory under GPU. But then even that is just a simplification because if you actually look deeper, there's actually also more nuanced uh, memory caches within the GPU. So even the GPU memory, there's like 
levels to it, right? There's GPU memories that are closer to the actual tensor processing uh, chips, and then there's memories that are a little bit further away. So there's kind of a continuous spectrum of memory and how close it is to the actual GPU. Uh, okay, this way we can index extremely long input sequences while every attention head and every decoder layer retrieves its top K keys. So the way that transformers work, there's basically three main players here. There's going to be the queries, the values, and the keys. And these are different matrices that are basically just big matrices of numbers that get multiplied. And these form the the kind of the, the meat of the transformer. So we demonstrate on Limiformer's efficacy on several long document and multi-document summarization benchmarks. So this is probably what they're going to be showing it on, showing that it can summarize even 350K token long inputs. So that's pretty long, right? Uh, if you actually think about, oops, if you actually think about uh, GPT, right, they were advertising, I think, 32K, right? GPT 32K context. Yeah, 32,000 token length model. So that's kind of the state of the art right now in terms of like accept the length of the input sequence but here you see 350k token long so this is really probably pushing the boundaries of the of the state of the art which i guess makes sense if the title of your paper is on limiformer you better have a really long input sequence or context without any input truncation at test time on limiformer improves pre-trained models such as bart and longformer by extending them to unlimited inputs without additional learned weights and without modifying their code. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. I wonder how they do it. So parts of this abstract make me think that they're just kind of going to be doing some clever kind of programming tricks. And then this part here confirms that they're probably just gonna be doing some clever programming tricks. Before, I felt like maybe this paper would have some interesting or novel modification to the actual transformer architecture itself. But after reading this abstract, I feel like they're probably just going to be doing some clever stuff because the key here is that uh, without modifi modifying their code, so they want to give a, a kind of an approach to unlimited input sequence length that can be used for any transformer, right? All right, let's keep going. Transformers, this is the original transformer paper, which probably has a huge amount of cit citations at this point. Like this paper is probably absolutely insane in terms of citations. If we go to Google Scholar, you can actually check out the uh, citation count. Yeah, look at this guy. This is 73,764 citations on this attention is all you need paper, right? <laughs> Fucking crazy. No other paper that this person wrote comes even close. So kind of shows you how much the academia is kind of a a lottery situation where if you just happen to get lucky, you're you're set. Uh, Pre-trained transformers generally have a context window of 512 tokens or 1024 tokens, which are sufficient lengths for many current conditional generation data sets. Okay. For input tokens between 1K and 6K tokens, specialized long context models have been developed. These models employ clever techniques to sparsify or approximate attention. Right, so transformers, as I've kind of repeated a bunch of times at this point, so I'm sorry if you've heard this rant, but transformers have this attention mechanism, which is fundamentally taking the input sequence and multiplying it by the input sequence. Not exactly, but for everything in the sequence, you're multiplying it against every other thing in the sequence. So as your input sequence increases, right, you're basically increasing the side of the both sides of the square, and that's why the total amount of kind of memory and compute is squared, right? It's O of N squared in terms of the input size. So one way you can fix that is by sp sparsifying or having approximate attention, which I don't know, here's some paper that does that. Allowing the maximum input length to quadruple while remaining computationally feasible. Data sets in this length include most long document summarization or question answering data sets such, such as archive summarization. What happens when uh, LLMs can just summarize papers? I think at that point, I'll just stop doing this YouTube channel. <laughs> if you can just feed an entire paper into, LL into 
an LLM in just it gives you the perfect summary back. All right, let's look at this figure here. So generally you try to pick the coolest looking figure for your uh, paper. So let's see what they're trying to impress us with. Long range transformers can avoid input truncation in some data sets. However, there are data sets with inputs many times longer than these models maximum input length. The dotted lines represent three common maximum input lengths for models. The bars are the average or maximum input length in each data set. Okay, so this is saying 1024 tokens, 40 tokens. This is different sizes, right? Different amounts of, of input. And this is showing you different data sets and how much, how many tokens there are total. So for example, an archive paper here, the average archive paper has somewhere in between, I don't know, it sounds like kind of like 6,000 tokens versus the average book summary here or I guess not average, this is max. So the maximum book summary has way more than that, right? You can see how it's, this is a, a log scale, so way more potential things. But it's kind of interesting how you have this kind of, even though this is a log scale plot, you see it's kind of tapering out, right? So theoretically, there is some maximum to the context that, exists right at some point no one's going to want a million token context right because if every single book is less than a million tokens do you even care anymore right so that's kind of my assumption is that at some point we'll hit a, a kind of like a a soft maximum where we don't really need any more tokens but i don't know maybe we'll continue to see more and more and more ways and this kind of arms race in terms of like how big can you make the input i think that's what i'm going to do for my phd make it kind of chat gpt but with substantially longer context size million tokens would be good for llm based agents yeah it's kind of i don't know it could be also the kind of whole rich sutton uh bitter lesson so rich sutton's bitter lesson was this guy Rich Sutton, who did a bunch of reinforcement learning stuff. And over his kind of academic life, he realized that really the only thing that matters is scale and compute, and everything else is you're just kind of wasting time until the compute gets uh, faster and the scale gets bigger. And kind of the longer deep learning and machine learning has gone, the more people realize that, hey, that Rich Sutton guy, he was actually correct. And <laughs> largely what we're doing is just sitting around waiting for the GPUs to get faster and that's going to drive 99% of the performance improvements. Okay, so what's actually the uh, context uh, size of GPT-4? I'm curious. So GPT-4 has a context size of about 8,000, and GPT-3 had about 4,000. So 16,000 is about the highest that they say here. And this is for some specific paper that probably had a longer talk context size. Uh, open domain tasks by generative question answering could conceivably synthesize information from even longer inputs. Answering questions about the aggregate properties of all living person articles on Wikipedia. Yeah, so the use living person kind of interesting word there because I think that in the future, it's actually probably going to be very common to have some kind of LLM or chatbot that knows everything about you, right? So every single piece of information that you've written, every single journal, right? Like you might have thousands of journal entries, thousands of emails, it'll just have all of those and it'll be kind of your personalized AI, right? So what is the context required to sufficiently represent a person? Can you fit every single one of your Facebook posts in 1 million tokens? Can you fit every single one of your tweets in 1 million tokens? Because once you get to a point where you can fit literally every single piece of information that someone's ever written inside that input, then I feel like that's all you need, right? In these extremely long input cases, vanilla transformers cannot be feasibly scaled as naive attention has quadratic complexity. Yeah, so this is kind of what I always try to explain with my little cube uh, hand gestures. Long input transformers, although more efficient than standard transformers, require significant computational resources. There is a paper uh, which used some kind of tricks to reduce the uh, quadratic complexity, but nobody's quote unquote solved it yet. 
Increasing the context window necessitates retraining the model from scratch with a new context window size, which is computationally, computationally and environmentally costly. Okay. We introduce Unlimiformer, a retrieval-based method which augments pre-trained language models, retrieval-based method. So, retrieval, kind of hot right now, right? This idea of like, hey, let's store the information not within the actual uh, model, but like in such a way that we can access it quickly, right? And this is kind of what they were talking here about being clever about shuffling stuff around the GPU and the CPU memory. Uh, Unlimited Former can be injected into any existing encoder decoder transformer to permit unbounded inputs. Given a long input sequence, Unlimited Former constructs a data store over the hidden states of all input tokens. Okay, so kind of vector database vibes coming in right here. Uh, the decoder standard cross attention queries the data store and it tends to the top K input tokens. Okay, so encoder decoder, encoder decoder. This is a very basic kind of concept in deep learning, but basic, this is I think a good little thing. The idea is that an encoder is going to take a high dimensional thing and turn it into a low dimensional thing, right? So it can turn an image into a little latent image. It can turn uh, a sequence into a little token. There's a million different kind of ideas and types of encoders and decoders, and there's different ways of using them, right? You can train something and then only use the encoder. You can train something, only use the decoder. But basically the idea is that you're taking information and you're compressing it down into a lower dimensional space, right? And this compression of the information into a lower dimensional space is where is, is literally what intelligence is, right? The, the finding a lower dimensional manifold that can map to the higher dimensional manifold. So in transformers, there's an encoder and a decoder, right? And here they're saying that the decoder is gonna be doing cross attention, but they wanted to do cross attention on all the tokens, right? But they don't have all the tokens inside the GPU memory. So they're gonna be, have, they're gonna be doing this clever retrieval where they're gonna go find the relevant tokens, right? That is specifically the top K tokens, bring them back, calculate attention on those. So some kind of like filtering, it seems. We'll fit, we'll see exactly how they're, what, what top K means, like how exactly are they judging whether a token is in that top K, right? Limit former can be applied directly over a trained model and can improve an existing checkpoint. When fine tuning, performance is further improved. Okay, so they're gonna apply this to Bart and Primera. I've never heard of this one, Primera. Without adding weights, without retraining, across a variety of long range sequence to sequence data sets. So sequence to sequence data sets are data sets where your input is a sequence and your output is a sequence. So text summarization is a sequence to sequence task, right? You're taking a sequence and then of the full raw text and then turning it into a smaller little sequence which represents the compressed or summarized text. Semantic search, I guess, is used for selecting top K. Yeah, but it's like what metric are they using, right? So for example, in computer vision, one way you could search for the top K quote unquote images is say, okay, well, I have this image and the clip vector of this image is this, and then I have this image and the clip vector of images of this image is this, and let me uh, basically get the dot product uh, and look at the cosine similarity between those two vectors, right? So what are what exactly are they using to, to kind of judge the quote unquote like similarity of, it might not even be that, it might just literally be the, yeah, it's gonna be something like that. It's gonna be dot product or cosine similarity, but maybe it's something cool and kind of clever. So we'll see. Uh, we also find that a limit former can be applied on top of a long former encoder, okay. So they're really kind of like pushing this idea that you don't need to add weights, you don't need to retrain, you can add it on top of an already existing thing. So you should be able to add this on top of Llama is basically what they're hinting at. If, you, if any of you are interested in that, it's probably an opportunity. I 
Transformers are limited in their maximum input length because of the fixed size of the encoder context window. And this this didn't also used to be the point, right? There, back in the day, sequences were more commonly uh, dealt with with uh, recurrent neural networks and LSTMs and different types of things like that. These are different model architectures that are now not very popular at all. Like RNNs, LSTMs, you barely see these things anymore. But GRUs, gated recurrent units, but I, those had more of a theoretical ability to kind of have an infinite context or infinite kind of look back, right? Because that RNN feeds its own input back to itself, right? So in some way, there's a very tiny amount of signal from the very beginning of, of, of kind of the sequence there. But transformers are not like that. Transformers, you feed the entire sequence in at the same time, right? So you're limited by that sequence. You can do all kinds of tricks, but you're fundamentally, the transformer is only paying attention to what's inside that. There's no notion of kind of like feeding in previous uh, previous inferences of the transformer into it. Uh, fixed context window may, be, may waste efforts on tokens that attention head does not attend strongly to. A limit former allows each head to choose a separate context window from the full length input at each decoding step. Okay, boom, there you go. I feel like that's literally it. This is formalized by injecting an Unlimiformer lookup into the decoder prior to cross attention. The model performs a k-nearest neighbor search in an external data store to choose a set of per decoder layer per attention head tokens to decode to. Okay, so this paragraph right here just explained this entire paper for us. So basically what they're going to be doing is that rather than, hey, I have this input sequence and you calculate the cross attention and it turns out that like 80% of that input sequence is not, is not useful for whatever the decoder wants to do, that specific little head in the decoder, and therefore it ends up zeroing out most of that. And this is why a lot of people use kind of sparsity, uh, sparsification of the attention, right? Because actually much of that attention cross attention calculation, you're just going to end up with really small little activations that don't matter. And they're driven by kind of the more important ones. So you on Limmy former is now saying, okay, well, what if we get rid of all those uh, activations that are very small and not very useful. And you would just get rid of them anyways with sparsity or sparsification techniques. And instead let's take our limited context size and just pack it with the, uh, the, the tokens, I guess, that are the most important, right? So the way it's going to do that is with a K nearest neighbor search. So K nearest neighbor is a very old school, very traditional uh, kind of algorithm. It's basically the idea of K and N image of you have some space. Usually in, in all of these, it's a two dimensional space, but you can do K nearest neighbors in a three dimensional space. You can do K nearest neighbors in a 512 dimensional space. You can do it in whatever dimensionality of, of a space you want, right? And all you're doing is saying, okay, I have some point here. And then what are the three nearest neighbors to it? The three nearest neighbors must be related to that point, right? And it's a way of grouping uh, points on, on, a, on, on a manifold, right? So you have a bunch of embeddings. You want to say which embeddings are related, which embeddings are not related. You can just do this K nearest neighbor. But K nearest neighbor also kind of going to be a little bit slower because you have to do a lot of comparisons, right? You have to compare every point to a bunch of other points a bunch of times. So it's like having a for loop inside a for loop inside a for loop, right? So it's, it's just going to be a little bit slow. Uh, but Llama is a GPT. And this thing is for encoder decoder. There's encoders and decoders inside GPT, right? GPT. Yeah, you could put it. Decoder. Yeah, but that's, I think that's what they're using here, right? They're saying they're they're just doing it on the decoder. Yeah, into the decoder. So 
I feel like you should be able to add it, but what's what's preventing you from adding this to ChatGPT is that you don't have access to the GPT code base. But you should be able to put it in there. I think that there's another reason that this isn't necessarily going to work, and that's because I think that the ordering of the sequence matters. I think that if you fed in a sentence into an LLM and then fed in that same sentence but took out every other word, it's not going to be the same thing. So I'm not entirely certain that this idea of taking the input and then taking out the the quote-unquote the words that aren't doing much and then f packing in the words that are doing more, I'm not entirely sure if that would actually, that's going to result in the same thing. I think that you're kind of fundamentally changing the nature of the input distri data distribution. So the model shouldn't necessarily perform well in that case. So I'm not sure. They do querying on embeddings from the encoder. Encoder kind of generates memory, but in decoder, you don't have this kind of memory. Got to process everything at once. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Let's keep going here. To encode an input sequence that is longer than the model's context window, we encode overlapping chunks of the input. Overlapping chunks. Keeping only the middle half of the outputs from each chunk. Hmm. Okay, so here we say, to ensure that the encodings only have sufficient context on both sides. So there's kind of like a padding going on here, right? Padding. Uh, Convolution. Padding is this idea in convol in uh, computer vision where, hey, you have uh, some convolution that's going through an image, and hey, what happens on the edges here? Let's just pad it, right? We'll add a bunch of zeros so that our convolution can work in the corners. So similar kind of idea here where uh, they add... Uh, they add basically the text on either side and then only take the middle so that the 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 encoder has access to what's before the token, what's before the sequence and what's after the sequence, but you only use the middle. <laughs> and there it is, they're using FAISS. FAISS is the Facebook uh, semantic uh, similarity database. And we've seen this used everywhere. Um, so I feel like we should have just probably guessed that they were using face. Let's actually see if they have it on their requirements. It's not here. That's kind of interesting. They have uh, transformers, wannabe, pandas. Hmm. Okay, retrieval augmented cross attention. In standard cross attention, a transformer decoder attends to the encoder's last hidden states, where the encoder usually truncates the input and encodes only the first k tokens in the input sequence. Yeah, so sometimes there's this kind of mask where basically the the decoder doesn't necessarily have access to the to the to what's after the specific token that it needs. Right, and this kind of boils, and th this comes from the fact that uh, all of these are generally trained on this kind of next token prediction. So if you can see the entire sentence, it's a different task than if you can just only see what the, what leads up to that exact point in the sentence. Instead of attending only to this top, this k token prefix, we retrieve the top k hidden states from a much longer input sequence for each cross attention head and attend only to these top K. So magic number K that's going on here. I wonder how they're gonna pick this number, this K. This allows retrieving keys from the entire input sequence instead of truncating. Our approach is that is also cheaper in computation and GPU memory than attending to all input tokens while usually preserving more than 99% of the attention mass. So I guess this attention mass maybe refers to the activations within the attention mechanism that are the most dominant, you know? Displays are generic changes to a sequence-to-sequence -sequence transformers architecture. The full input is encoded using the encoder in chunks and stored in a data store. And then the data store of encoded hidden states is queried at each decoding step. This feels like it's gonna be very slow 
You know, you're you're telling me that every for every single every time the decoder goes, whatever the length of that input is, right? If you have a 16k uh, input or context, you're gonna have to do 16k queries to this data store. That feels like that would be extremely slow. So maybe it's getting chunks, right? Maybe there's some kind of chunk length here. The KNN search step is non-parametric and can be injected into any pre-trained sequence to sequence transformer. Hmm. Yeah, I still I still also feel like my my intuition here is screaming at me and telling me that like you can't just take random chunks out of context like that, right? It's like I feel like transformers aren't good at that, right? It's like, imagine taking this paragraph here and then encoding every single word in here, right? That's what they're doing. It putting in a data and then having a decoder that picks out only the words that it wants, right? So it picks out the word attending and then top K and then GPU memory and then 99%, right? And the decoder only uses these four words, right? I feel like it's going to get a very, a fundamentally different answer than if you fed it uh, the entire paragraph kind of sentence by sentence, right? Like I feel like the, the filler words have a purpose in English language and it changes the semantic meaning of the overall sequence. So, I don't know. It seems like they delegate a part of what cross attention does to face, kind of offloading this gigantic memory mass taking long code time. Yeah, maybe maybe that's kind of the answer. They're kind of the rebuttal to what I'm saying is that hey, actually, if you feed the thing sentence by sentence, the decoder is actually largely because of the way the uh, cross attention works, it's ignoring pretty much everything except for the word attending. So, it's not like you're you're losing information because the information would have been lost anyways by the decoder anyways. The decoder would have just quickly been okay. The 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 only word that matters here is attending. So. Yeah, maybe it doesn't actually really matter. All right, we'll see. The use of data store for the encoded tokens uh, increases the maximum input length significantly. However, this naive approach requires constructing separate data stores for each for the attention keys and values at each layer. Ooh, in each head. That is no bueno. <laughs> That's no good. We're, yeah, you're gonna have a huge amount of data stores because the encode the embeddings are gonna be different at each head, right? As you go further up the transformer, the the actual sequence is isn't using the same uh, kind of tokens, right? Because every time you you feed it through a layer, it's now a difference. It's kind of a different space, a different feature space. So you're going to have to have different data stores for each layer. Shit, dude, that's fucking gross. You're going to have to have like 10 different FAISS data stores running. Why do they need to store? Yeah, I would have thought that they just did it at the very beginning. But it's kind of like this hierarchical pattern where there's probably you get better technique. Doesn't vanilla transformer use only the last layer embeddings? I think it might use... Yeah, so this is what you were saying. You're saying that normally the decoders use only the last layer here. So if they made a data store for this, then all of these decoder layers would use the same data store. But it sounds like the what they're describing, they have a different data store for every single layer and that each one is, is going kind of horizontally like this. So I don't know. This is actually a great little uh, great little blog post, by the way. I remember this is a very old blog post at this point, but this guy's legit, Jay Olimar. He has a YouTube channel too, yeah. Super legit. Does he still make content? He still makes content, look at that. Two days ago, three weeks ago, three months ago. This dude's legit. Um, okay, let's go back here. Okay, so something a little sketchy going on here where they have basically the data store per layer. A little, little weird, but we'll see exactly what's going on. A separate data store for each attention head in each decoder layer would be both time intensive to create and space intensive. So not surprisingly, 
apply their memory layer to only a single decoder layer. Okay. We present a different order of computing the well-known transformer attention formula, which allows us to store a single data store across all attention heads and all decoder layers. What? So attention heads are separate from the decoder layers, right? Attention head is more like the depth. So here, this and this and this, these are all layers, but each of these here, there's like a depth to it, right? So this is one layer, but there may be a depth to that, right? So that's what they, whenever they say, uh, there's a, the difference between the heads and the layers is basically the, the vertical versus the, the depth. The standard cross attention calculator for a single head in a transformer is this. This is your basic um, attention uh, mechanism here. You have the values, you have the keys, you have the queries. Ooh, sometimes the LaTeX is weird on this. And then this is the dimensionality of your uh, keys or the number of heads or something like that. I forget. 100% they're going to store last layer embeddings. Yeah, it seems like seems like what they're building too. Q is the product of the decoder state and the query weight matrix. K and V are the products of the last encoder hidden state with the key and value weight matrices. Our goal is to retrieve the best set of keys, key best, that maximize QKT with the size of K best fixed to the size of the model's context window. Okay, so this is how they're choosing K. So the best K tokens, if you have a 4,000 uh, token input or context size, it's gonna be 4,000. So uh, the choice of K is going to depend on what type of model you wanna use. So, right, they were talking about in their introduction here how you can apply this to any transformer. So depending on which transformer you use, you're gonna have a different K and you're gonna use a different K there. Yeah, I don't know what maximize means. I guess it's just the total amount of activation, the total like size, I don't exactly know, right? Because the queries and the keys, right? If the queries happen, like whenever the queries and the keys, like whenever they both align, right? And you have a high activation, that number is going to be higher than if the queries and the keys aren't really vibing with each other and you give a really small number. So maybe what they mean by maximizing the matrix is just that every single uh, value inside that matrix is a, is a higher number rather than just some number that's very, very close to zero. But it's kind of like, to me, it still feels weird, right? It's kind of like the whole, um, like there's this meme where people are like, oh, you're only using 10% of your brain at a time. Imagine if you're using 100% of your brain. And then the answer to that is if you used 100% of your brain, it's called a seizure, right? And it's like, if all your neurons are firing at the same time, you're basically having a seizure. So I think like my intuition is there's something similar in a transformer, right? It's like, they could have provided this intuition. Yeah. To me, it's like, if everything in this QKT matrix is just firing and all the, all, all the different activation activations inside that uh, attention matrix are firing, then really none of them are firing, right? It's kind of like just like a seizure is going on and it's very difficult to see what is actually the noise or what is the signal and what is the noise in that. Okay, let's keep going. Let HD be the decoder state and HE be the last encoder. Ooh, Jesus Christ, my summarization. HE is the last encoder layer's hidden state. Okay, so HE is this, is the last encoder layer and the hidden state of that. So it's basically what's getting passed. And HD is the decoder state, which is inside each of these, right? Uh, HD times the weight of the queries, HE times the keys. This T is a transpose because in order to multiply these two matrices, you need to transpose that so that the dimensions match. And here they kind of simplify that out right? They're doing a little bit of matrix math here and they're saying, okay, well, I can pull out this, this uh, transposes, I can apply it to each of these. And when I apply it to each of these, then I can calculate this and then multiply by that and do my uh, PEMDAS, I think it's called, right? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And there you go. And 
I bet you they're going to say that there's some advantage of doing this. The retrieval step can be formulated as choosing the encoder hidden states HE that maximize this. This rewriting has two major advantages. There is no need to store the keys for each head and layer separately. We can store in a single data store of the hidden states HE only and just project the queries into HD whatever using head specific WQ and WK. Can you do that? I don't know if that's necessarily good. I think maybe they're... So... The dimensionality of HE, right? The encoder hidden states are going to have some dimensionality, right? Maybe it's like a 1,000 dimensional space. Each encoder head is going to have probably like a little a little region of that state space of that 1000 dimensional state space where all of the where it kind of projects things right so maybe they're kind of abusing the fact that your your that each encoder head is going to have its own little area of that 1000 dimensional space that you can go to so that there's no you don't need to worry about accidentally using the wrong head or like multiple heads projecting to the same point. This feels a little sketchy, right? But I don't know. Let's see. Let's, let's see <laughs> what a sketchy paper. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard to say, right? Cause it's like, what the fuck does the 1000 dimensional embedding of like 10 different encoder heads, like wh what are each of the, are all of them doing the same thing? Are all of them doing different things? Is it kind of, Right, like everybody loves the kind of uh, visualizations of the feature maps at the lower level of a convolutional network where you can see, oh, this feature map is very clearly an edge detector. And this one over here is very clearly a uh, edge detector that's top down, right? And you have these kind of like different, it's very easy to say each of the different feature maps in this lower level of a convolutional network corresponds to some kind of specific feature, right? But when you're talking about the very last encoder layer in a transformer and you have like, I don't know, maybe 16 heads on that. Like what is each of those heads doing? Are they each doing something different? Are they all kind of doing the same thing, right? And it becomes harder and harder to kind of intuit as you go up higher and higher up into a neural net, what exactly those, those neurons are kind of doing, what exactly that head is doing. Uh, just project the queries using head specific WQ and WK. Second, the values can be calculated trivially given HE, so there is no need to store the values in a separate data store than the keys. Okay, so a little bit of potentially GPU memory cache optimization there. Rather than constructing two by L by H data stores and retrieving from every data store during each decoding step, we construct a single data store and retrieve from it by just projecting the decoder hidden states to per head HD WQ WK. Okay, so I think this might be, yeah, okay. So they're talking about K nearest neighbors, right? So K nearest neighbors, and then where are they doing that K nearest neighbors calculation? They're doing the K nearest neighbors calculation between the encoder hidden states and then the uh, decoder uh, states here, this HD, multiplied by WQ, WK. So HE and then HD, WQ, WK are going to project into the same embedding space. So what they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, the decoder hidden state, we're going to project it to this embedding space. And then we have a data store with a bunch of points in that same embedding space. So now that we know what point we want, we can go and look at all the points around it and say, okay, what are the points around it? And then though that's how you get it. So this space right here, the HDWQWK is the same space as this HE. So things that are close together there should be semantically similar and related and useful in uh, calculating a uh, whatever you want to do, text summarization. 
This reformulation has not, to our knowledge, been performed before in retrieval augmented attention. This allows the application of retrieval augmented attention at each head and layer with negligible increase in time and space required. Yeah, and I mean, the interesting thing here is that if this actually works quite well, then it's a reason to uh, increase the number of heads in the transformer, right? So there's a hyperparameter when you're designing a transformer, which is how many heads do, do you use, right? I, I think like 16 heads is a number that kind of pops up to my head, but you could have a million heads if you wanted, right? And you're, you're kind of limited by... maybe the the size of your gpu but here you don't this means that you might not be limited by the you might not need to your your gpu uh usage might no longer be related to the amount of heads you have the number of heads you have merely just increases the size of this data store so i don't know maybe this unlocks the ability to have transformers with a huge amount of heads cheers from brazil obrigado that's the only Brazilian word I know. <laughs> In contrast to memorizing transformer single layer retrieval augmentation and retrieves the same tokens for each attention head. Unlimiformer uses one data store and allows retrieval augmentation over any number of layers and individualized retrieval per head. Hmm. Okay, let's see. Table one, a comparison of the training methodologies using BART with a context window size of 1024. So everything they're doing here seems to be with BART, which is kind of the smallest possible LLM you could use, to be honest. BART is like almost medieval at this point. It has a tiny context window, very small, very kind of old. I feel like I would have liked them to see, would have liked them to use like Llama or one of these uh, more modern uh models but i don't know whatever this is fine as a running example the dash line separates methods that are approximately the same training cost as the baseline from those that require significant additional compute okay so the baseline they're using bart so again bart has 1024 context window here the total number of tokens seen at training time okay so it can only of course pay attention to 1024 tokens validation time input it's always going to be the same Okay, plus unlimiformer, everything remains the same, except you can now add unlimited tokens on test time. Early stop with unlim unlimiformer, you can now validate with unlimited tokens, and then train chunked plus test, you can do all tokens. I don't really know what the fuck this is trying to tell me, but it's trying to, it's, I guess it's trying to say when can you use this, so Mostly you're only using this at test, but you can also use this in validation in some specific cases, and you can also, no, you can't use this at training. So this is not usable in training. It's only usable in validation and testing is what this graph is telling me or this table. Dim model over dim heads. That's the number of heads. The method as described can be used at test time on an already trained model. Next, we turn our focus on training methodologies to further improve the performance of Unlimiformer. Low additional cost training methods. We first consider training strategies that do not require significant additional compute as compared to the standard fine tuning regime. What if they use LoRa's? <laughs> as the simple case, we use a standard fine tuning regime where the input is truncated during training at inference time only, we inject unlimiformer into the train model to process full length inputs. We train without the unlimiformer, but when we evaluate the model for early stopping, we use unlimiformer for generation on the validation set. This results in choosing a slightly different checkpoint to stop training at. The additional computational cost here is minor and comes only from the application of unlimiformer during inference over the validation set. Train chunked. As a data augmentation strategy, we split each training example into chunks of the context window size and treat each chunk as its own training example. This is orthogonal, but has the advantages that all the embeddings from the full length training example are back propagated into the training instead of truncated. Okay. I don't, I don't know why this is included, 
but they're trying to compare to something. So each head only sees a slice of the original or whatever is giving to it from the previous one. That's what you're saying. Uh, all right, long range training methods. We also consider training on Limiformer directly, which introduces additional computation cost. At each training step, the full training, longer than context window, so the entire thing, right? So if you have a whole book, it's going to be the entire book. And here they're encoded in chunks. So they break up the book into little paragraphs and then encode each paragraph. The keys for each decoder layer are chosen randomly from the encoded hidden states. Okay, so this is a pretty good baseline. I do like this. So rather than, of course, they, they're here, they're going to construct a data store. They're going to project the decoder hidden states into the same space as the data store. And they're going to be able to find the most related things, right? The most related uh, embed encoder hidden states. But what do they compare that to? So one thing they can compare it to is random encoder hidden states. So rather than picking the K nearest neighbors, just pick some random ones and this weekly simulates nearest neighbor search. No, it doesn't. What? Depends on what they mean by random here, but for each decoder layer, are randomly chosen from the encoder hidden states of the same layer? What? I don't feel like that's gonna do any, oh, it's because the input is in chunks. Okay, yeah, yeah. So if you take a whole book and then you chunk it into paragraphs and then you only feed it chunk by chunk, you're only randomly chose, choosing from that chunk, right? So here, the chosen randomly, the chosen randomly isn't over the entire thing. It's not over the entire book. It's only over that specific paragraph. So I guess there's something there where it's a little bit uh, more similar. Yeah, I don't know if this simulates, oh, nearest neighbor search. I, I, I disagree with this statement, but... Uh, let's keep going. At each training step, the keys for each decoder header layer are selected using a can and search. This is not exact. If the inputs... <laughs> what are you upset about, Kalina? What doesn't? <laughs> this is not exact. If the inputs are longer than 16K tokens, as memory requirements at training time require the truncation of the input. However, this is closest to test time computation. The keys for each decoder head and layer are selected using a KNN search. Yeah, random selection does not simulate NN search, but it's like a constrained random selection. Yeah. Uh, to gain the benefits of each, we alternate epochs of random encoded training and retrieval training. Dude, what? Alternating epochs? So, I mean, this this is almost getting into curriculum kind of learning and like that's a whole field of machine learning where it's like okay well how exactly do you interleave data sets like let's say you had multiple data sets that you wanted to train on right like do you train one batch of data set a into one batch of data set b into one batch of data set a into one batch of data set b do you mix the data sets and then train on both of them do you train on one and then the other one like how do you change the learning rate there's and then curriculum curriculum stuff gets even more crazy when you're talking about reinforcement learning and uh, robotics where you might have a simpler task and then you change that into a more difficult task. So I feel like alternating epochs of this random encoded training and retrieval training, like that is just some random weird shit, right? It's like, it's like what does that even mean, right? Like you're just gonna get something really, really weird. Is that some, is that a fair comparison, right? It's like you're comparing against randomness and you're comparing, comparing against some weird, like Frankenstein style situation. So are those necessarily good things to compare to? The use of random, neighbor, random neighbors increases the likelihood that all tokens will be chosen as keys occasionally while retrieving training is identical to the test time setting for most inputs. 
Okay. What does random neighbors mean? Right. If you're saying random neighbors, that means that you're filtering between neighbors and non-neighbors. So is there some threshold? Is Are you just saying, hey, here we're going to pick the 100 nearest neighbors and then pick 10 randomly out of those? Is that what it means by random neighbors? Right. Right, but is it random selection from a limited set of neighbors or is it random selection over the entire set, right? Random selection, yeah. We experiment with three long document summarization data sets with varying domains and properties. Table two contains summary statistics. Uh, government report and some screen are included in the scrolls benchmark. And BERT score F1. F1 score. I know what F1 score is, but I don't know what BERT F1 score is. Or BERT score F1. Government report. So that's this uh, data set here is a long document summarization data set where the task is to write an executive summary as of a US government support. Okay, so in this example, this is a summarization task with 19,000 examples. The average context length is around 9,616. So 9,000 is bigger than the current GPT-4 context length, but uh, significantly smaller than the 32K context which is being advertised by GPT or OpenAI uh, as something that they're going to do in the future and you're trying to go from basically 10,000 tokens to about half or an order of magnitude less than that around 600 tokens and you can see here the distribution so 74k tokens is the smallest example of the input and then 303,000 K, or 303k tokens is the highest so there's actually quite a big difference here in terms of the distribution of inputs and then you have TV show and uh, book summaries as well so kind of interesting how if you actually look at these numbers here the the largest government report is 303,000 tokens. The largest book is 354,000 tokens. So what what does that mean? Does that mean that there's some kind of fundamental human uh, limit to that, right? Like, is there something there about like, hey, humans have a limited attention span and the attention span of a human when it comes to like long form books and government contracts always ends up being around 300,000, right? I don't know. Is there like a hidden pattern there? Uh, book sum and some screen recap of the TV show episode uh, provided the transcript and book sum has a paragraph book level embeddings blah blah, blah. one piece has infinite amount of tokens <laughs> I mean how many episodes of one piece 1061 okay uh how uh, length of one episode of one piece 20 minutes so we'll say 25 minutes so 1000 episodes at 25 minutes and then how many words per minute let's see words per minute uh for tv show 170 words per minute so i'm, I'm picking the biggest numbers out of all of these <laughs> 170 words per minute and uh, tokens to words is like 1.4 or something like that words to tokens it's like slightly more so 0 0.75 or 1.25 actually all right so one piece is <laughs> fucking 5 million tokens <laughs> holy shit dude <laughs> 5,300,000 tokens. There you go. Maybe the 1 million context is actually required if you want to feed the entirety of one piece into a model. Uh, dying Relu, thank you for the support, man. Or person. Or robot. Or cat. Or whatever you are. Uh, commonly used for summarization tasks. It has a maximum sequence length of tokens. 
Primera is a long former encoder decoder with 447 million parameters, pre trained specifically for multi document summarization. Its maximum input length is 4,000 tokens. In the encoder, the global attention is sparse over the full sequence with a dense local attention in a 1024 token window. So this is a 2022 paper where it seems like basically they're using the sparsity in the attention map in order to deal with a large uh, input length. That's probably, if I had to bet money about what uh, GPT and OpenAI are doing to get this 32K context, I bet you it's not a retrieval-based approach. I bet you it's a sparsity-based approach, if I had to guess, but I actually don't know. I'm just guessing there. Uh, another thing here, SLED is a method for augmenting pre-trained encoder-decoder models for larger contexts or longer contexts by performing fusion in, in decoder. What? What do they mean by fusion here? This allows for the use of pre-trained models with an expensive fine-tuning, and the input sequence length is eventually memory bounded. Okay, I don't really know what they mean, but probably doesn't matter because it's probably already outdated as we're speaking. Uh, memorizing transformers is the most similar work to ours. They propose a trainable attention gate that moderates between the standard cross-attention and attention over retrieved keys from a data store. So attention gate right there, boom, that's... That to me screams LSTM, right? So good old LSTMs, which are pretty much dead at this point, have famously a gate on them, right? Uh, let's see if I can find. I forget exactly which one of these it is, but there's this little gate that basically lets signal go through or blocks the signal, right? And it's trainable. It has a little bit of parameters in there that can get changed over time. Yeah, here you go. So you have the forget gate, and you have the input gate, and you have the output gate. So the forget gate picks what is actually going to be stored for the for the next kind of... So the way these uh, LSTMs work is like they kind of feed the input back to each other constantly. So you see here how the hidden state, H of T, gets fed out here, and then it gets put in here. So the next time you perform inference with this little block, it receives the output of the previous time you performed inference with this block, right? And what this forget gate is doing is it's basically adding stuff to the memory or quote unquote forgetting it or adding, or adding stuff to it. And these little gates here are basically the same concept that I'm seeing here, attention gate that moderates. So Wu et al, one of these people knows about LSTMs. It's basically RNNV2. I think it's the best candidate for infinite context transformers. Yeah, I, I, I feel like, I don't know, I kind of like this data store, right? I think that data stores and kind of this explicit retrieval-based methods will probably be the way that it works because the, the problem with RNNs and uh, LSTMs and things like that where you're kind of modifying this memory that keeps getting passed around is that you, you need to increasingly uh, compress the information in your memory, right? Whenever, as a human, you do this, so like as you get more and more experience and your life becomes longer and longer, as a human, you're kind of like compressing your memories into a smaller and smaller representation, right? When you're a kid, you have like kind of a whole memory of like elementary school, but then once you're in college, your your memory of elementary school be is becomes more compressed and you start to kind of like compress it. And then by the time you're older, Elementary school is just this tiny compressed representation of what really was like a whole decade of your life, right? And LSTMs and recurrent neural networks are doing the same thing. They're compressing the information that goes further and further back in time into like a smaller and smaller and smaller amount of stuff. And so you're, you're losing information when you do that. And I think that people are very afraid of neural networks uh, giving the wrong answer and, and kind of not being quote unquote like truthful, right? So I think these retrieval based methods will become the standard because they can be exact, right? You know exactly what this exact activation was for this exact input in the encoder at that exact point in time. So it's like, you're not losing information anymore. You can store kind of an infinite amount of information in a data store. So that would be my guess, but I don't know. It might be the case that 
uh, the RNN that you're describing uh, becomes more powerful and then they just end up using that, right? This is equivalent to their setting with the learn interpolation parameter G set to one. Our work differs from memorizing transformers in several key ways, added additional weights, and thus cannot easily leverage pre-trained LMs. While unlimiformer is fully non-parametric and can improve performance without fine tuning. I guess fully non-parametric, maybe like there is this this K here, right? They, there is a K, but we did they did say that the K is chosen based on the K uh, on the input length of the transformer itself, right? So for ba for uh, Bert, you're using 1024. So maybe there isn't any hyperparameters here, but it's I feel like there probably is going to be a, a hyperparameter somewhere. There's going to be a hyperparameter that they don't tell you about <laughs> that they just pick. So I don't know about this non-parametric. Maybe they're just referring to the fact that it's non-parametric in that there's no weights to it, right? It's not like you have an additional module that you're training and and you have to basically train those weights, right? So you don't need to fine tune on Limiformer. On Limiformer is basically just a database that you're pulling from. Wu-Al applies attention retrieval to a single layer because of computational constraints. Okay. Allows for the use of a Limiformer in every decoder layer while still being efficient. Experimental results, long document summarization, shows the result in the long document summarization datasets. First, we can see that applying a Limiformer on existing checkpoint without any training improves BART by, for example, 1.8 Rouge 1 points. How good is that? Like, what is the, explain, Explain how Rouge 1 scoring works for LLMs. Recall oriented understudy for gisting. Like, is this real? <laughs> is ChatGPT lying to us? This sounds like made up science. Rouge. I don't. Fuck you. Don't tell him. No. Rouge. Uh, scoring. Recall oriented understudy for guessing. Okay, it is correct. Quality of summaries generated by automatic summarization systems. The number of occurrences of each unique word in both the system and the reference summaries. For each unique word present in the reference summary, the minimum count of that word, both in the reference summaries, is found. Unigram overlap. Is that like a, a good measure of that? I feel like... Hmm, higher rouge, higher degree of similarity. Yeah, so this seems similar, like in computer vision, you have this notion of like a perceptual similarity and then uh, just like an L2 distance between two images, right? And you have to be careful because semantic content is different than something like this, which is basically just like looking at how many times they use the same word in both of the paragraphs. So much like any other quantitative uh, number, it. I don't know, my intuition here based on what ChatGPT just told us is that ink slightly increasing Rouge 1 is probably, there's, you probably shouldn't assign too much weight to that. Uh, Got to get OpenAI to notice this thing. Good point on exactness. Saved machine states. Saved machine states? It's called like a bleu. Bleu and rouge, those are both French words. Uh, applying sled without additional training decreases performance. Unlimiformer is the only model that can be applied training free. Early stop with unlimiformer is also shown to be a very efficient training approach. Uh, so early stopping is basically when you're training these neural networks um, uh, overfitting, you are constantly basically training and then evaluating in what's called validation, right? And 
you want to make sure that you stop training uh, once your validation error uh, become kind of starts to deviate from the training error. And there's a lot of uh, packages such as WANB, uh, weights and biases, and other other types of tools that will constantly check. And if it and it, once they get to a threshold where the error is no longer going down, or the loss isn't going down, or there's some uh, split between the validation and the and the training loss, then they'll early stop, which means they'll stop the training. So it seems like here what they're talking about is early stopping based on on Limiformer. Thanks for this one. The long range training methods in table four show consistent improvements in almost all metrics and data sets. A Limiformer outperforms SLED and memorizing transformer baselines with the same model. Experiment with Primera show two important points. A Limiformer that is based on BERT, BART. I think they meant BERT. The fuck is BART? <laughs> I think that's a misspelling. BART uh, LLM? Oh no, it's a real thing. All right, there you go. BART, denoising sequence to sequence pre-training for natural language. So it's just like a kind of like a variant of BERT. Okay. Performs better than the baseline Primera, even though Primera was pre-trained on much more data using a pre-training objective that was designed for summarization. These experiments show that all, not only can Unlimiformer outperform long-former based models, Unlimiformer can also be applied on top of the existing long-range transformer. So you can take an already existing long-range transformer and make it even more long-range. Long-range squared. Book summarization. Uh, in book sum, we see improvements from applying a Limiformer using both BART base and Primera. Random encoded retrieval and alternating training show competitive performance. What the fuck? Random encoded, like this random stuff that they were doing is competitive performance? Dude, what? You just randomly pick embedding, like activations from the encoder and it works pretty well? That's a little weird. The low cost training methods underperform these training strategies but outperform the baseline models. Even applying Unlimiformer without training modifications improves over the base models in most settings. Entity mentions. Outperforms all base models, but the truncation baseline also shows relatively high performance on the automatic metrics. I guess the automatic metrics is things like rouge and blue. Bleu. This is a strong counterintuitive for book summarization where the plot of the book should not be apparent from reading the first pages. In the outputs from this baseline, we observe limited coherence at a high rate of hallucination. So truncation baseline is where they're basically saying, okay, we're actually just gonna, we're gonna truncate the input. So we wanna compare uh, a summarization where you have access to the whole book, all 16K tokens, versus a just the beginning of the book, right? The first 1,000 tokens. And then they're saying, okay, well, actually, if we only give you the first 1,000 tokens, your performance should be pretty shit, right? Your summary should be garbage because you don't know what the book is about, right? And they're like, this is strongly counterintuitive, right? How can you give us a good summary of this book if you're, we're only giving you the first 1,000 tokens? And I think here's here is the real answer. The real answer is that Bert was trained on that fucking book. <laughs> The summary is is good because it already knows what the book is, right? You give it the first 1,000 characters of the book, and the LLM, which has probably seen that book in that in its data, it's like, oh, I know what this book is, and it gives you the summary. So that, or maybe all books are more similar than you think. I don't know. It is kind of that. That would be my guess as to why, even with just just the beginning of the book, you're able to provide a pretty good summary. Yeah, sampling uniformly should kind of guarantee that you've seen almost everything. Or maybe kind of like transformers or kind of like uh, convnets, right? Where 
<laughs> I feel like every every example that I give for intuition is computer vision based, and I apologize if, if other people don't have the same brain that I do. But like in a convolutional neural net uh, receptive field, right? As you go higher and higher up in a convolutional neural net, the receptive field becomes bigger, right? So in this example here, right, you have the lower layer, which is the image, and then you go higher and higher and higher, right? The neurons in the highest layers are effectively looking at the entire image, right? Like the neuron in this layer here, this intermediate layer, only sees or is only able to access information in this small green square. But as you go higher up, the information available to that specific neuron becomes bigger, right? The receptive field becomes bigger and bigger as you go higher up inside a convolutional neural net. I think there's probably a similar situation happening with uh, uh, here inside a transformer where in here, in these encoders, they're kind of they're probably paying to more paying attention to kind of more microscopic things and then once you go higher and higher up they're probably paying attention to like more general kind of higher level things it's not quite the same because in a convolutional neural net it's like you're literally convolving so it's like they literally don't have access to the rest of the image and in a transformer you're you're seeing the entire sequence so even this one at the bottom has the entire sequence, but I still feel like there's probably a hierarchy where the the ones at the bottom here, even though they have access to the full input, they're they're kind of maybe only paying attention to like kind of more small local kind of features and then or higher frequency features sometimes they're called. And then once you go higher up, you get the like kind of higher level semantic uh, low frequency features. Uniform sampling is kind of like atrus convolution. Yeah. And it's not just text summarization, it's summarization that uses a benchmark like the Rouge one, which is kind of like pseudo bullshit because it's basically just saying, hey, uh, do you have unigram overlap? Right? <laughs> Does your text summary of Harry Potter include the word Harry Potter? And if it doesn't include the word Harry Potter, you're bad. Right? But if you were reading a text summary of the Goblet of Fire, the word Harry Potter is actually not very important to the summary, right? Following the use of entity reference measures in medical summarization, that's where all the money's at, medical. Is that actually how you spell medical? Medicial? Sparse lookup is enough for sparse outputs, yeah. Uh, we use an entity-based metric as a proxy for informat informativeness of the candidate summaries. We use Spacey to tag all named entities in the gold summary and collect a set of unique entities. We then tag each candidate summary and compute the percentage of entities present in this summary. We report this metric, abbreviated entment, entity ment mentions, maybe? The unlimiformer exhibits far higher entity recall, and even adding unlimiformer only at test time without customized training doubles the entity recall of summaries from the base model. Is entity recall good? I don't know if it is, right? Like the notion of precision recall, right? Um, I've shown this a million times, so I apologize. And Feel free to tell me what you guys like. Like sometimes I feel like maybe I go too low level. I just kind of like explain basic concepts over and over again, but I figured maybe that's what people come here to try to learn and stuff. So it's okay. But if you guys feel like I'm getting too repetitive, just let me know. But recall is how many items, how many relevant items are retrieved. Precision is how many of the retrieved items are relevant. So in the context or in the uh, context of a, I hate that the word context is, means multiple things there, but in the context of text summarization, recall might be, hey, do you get the names of the four characters in this book correctly? Do you get all four of them? Versus precision is, hey, uh, uh, you told me in this summary uh, four names, and one of the names isn't even a character in Harry Potter, right? 
So recall might be, hey, do you get Harry, Hermione, and, and Ron? Versus precision might be, hey, you say that there's Harry, uh, Hermione, and then John, right? Like there's nobody called John in the Harry Potter book. So that in that case, the precision would be low, right? But it seems like here, what they're interested in is entity recall, which is, I guess, the ability to get specific entities in the book summary. I like how deep you go. I appreciate it. Input limitation. To evaluate the performance gains from using the full input, we artificially impose a maximum data store size. Yeah, I mean, you're just going to be limited to the size of your compute, right? And you can have, so this is also a kind of like a point on kind of computer hardware as well. You could have a, a, con, a data store that's only in memory and that'll be the fastest one, right? You, if you have uh, 32 gigs of RAM, you could have probably not 32 gigs, but you could have like 20 gigs of in-memory data storage. And at, the, and at that point, that would be pretty fast. If you wanted 500 gigs for a data store, now you have to put it either in a solid state disk or in an actual like hard disk, which would be even slower. So even even outside, so I, I was saying how in the GPU, there's different levels of like uh, memory caches within the GPU and some of them are faster than others. On the other side, in terms of like the actual computer and your motherboard, even within there, there's different levels of memory storage, right? Where your hard disk is the slowest, then you have your solid state, your flash, which is faster, and then you have the RAM or the actual memory sticks that are fitting in your DDR slots. Those are the fastest ones. And then I think even the CPU has a cache as well. So even within your CPU, there's, there's I think there's a, a little tiny memory cache in there as well. Let's see, CPU memory cache. Yeah, so even the CPU itself has a little tiny uh, CPU cache. But it's very small, 256 kilobytes to 32 megabytes versus your RAM is gonna be something like 16 gigs, 32 gigs, 64 gigs. All right, so here they have their the good old BART, a couple different sizes. So you have base and then LED, which is, I guess, the other model. Here are the different techniques that they were comparing against. So this is the one that's kind of uh, similar to the LSTMs and GRUs, the memorizing transformer, and then versus unlimited unlimiformer. And this is the rouge. So this is that that the score here, right? That basically just looks about how many how much overlap is there between the unique words in the summary and the unique words in the uh, actual uh, report. So report versus the summary of the report. And I don't know. I'm not very convinced here. <laughs> Look at this, 26, 27, 25, 25, 19, 19, 19. Like these numbers are all kind of the same, especially for like whenever you have a quantitative uh, a benchmark like that, a quantitative metric like Rouge that is already kind of a little bit bullshit, getting a one point score increase on a kind of bullshit metric doesn't mean anything, right? If you had double the Rouge, then that's worth something, but if you're only getting a one point improvement in Rouge, like, is that something? Does that mean anything? I don't know. What is L? Rouge one, two, and L. Let's see. What is Rouge one versus Rouge two and Rouge L? Okay, I mean, you just, you just told us, GPT. You don't need to tell us what Rouge is again. Little buddy, just tell us what the difference between 1, 2, and L are. Uh, new paper. I'm thinking about reading a paper per day to catch up. How far back do you think it's worth to go? I don't think it's necessarily worth reading historical papers. This might be... Uh, controversial opinion and I'm sure people like Jan LeCun and like those kind of old people who've been working in the field for like three decades like 
they put a lot of importance on kind of like the historical lead up, but I don't know. I feel like me personally, for example, like I've read so many papers on convolutional neural nets, like way back in the day. And now all of those are worthless, right? It's like the, the, the field of machine learning just moves so quickly that like you read a paper about a specific technique, it feels great. And then within two years, that technique is worthless and you largely just wasted your time reading that paper. So I feel like if you're, if you want to be uh, kind of in the machine learning space and you want to be reading these papers, just, just kind of jump in and just start reading the, the papers that are coming out, right? Just read the papers that are coming out and you'll, you'll over time, you'll build an intuition. And do I think there's some papers that are worth reading? Like the original transformer paper? Sure. The original ImageNet paper? Sure. Like there's, there's, there is some historical papers that are worth reading, but I wouldn't focus on older papers. I would try to read papers that are as recent as possible. Yeah. And honestly, like knowing statistics and linear algebra, like those types of things I feel like are way more important than reading uh, a paper such as this one, right? Like this unlimiformer, like <laughs> I don't think it's like, it is not going to necessarily have a huge impact on your career and your understanding and your knowledge, but getting very good at statistics and understanding distributions, KL divergence, like log probabilities, cross entropy, like all those things, knowing all of those really well is going to be significantly more important than uh, knowing what Primera is or what SLED is or any of these kind of individual techniques. Okay, what did uh, ChatGPT tell us? So Rouge 1 is overlap of unigrams. Rouge 2 is bigrams, which is pairs of consecutive words. So the overlap of bigrams, okay, so uh, Rouge 1 would be like Harry, Rouge 2 would be like Harry Potter, and then Rouge L measures the similarity between based on longest common subsequence. So Harry Potter, the boy who lived. I don't know. So <laughs> basically they're all different versions of the same thing, but basically it seems like whether or not you're, it's a single word, multiple words, or like little chunks of words captures longer phrases and better approximates the overall coherence. So Rouge 1 versus Rouge 2 versus Rouge L versus Burt's score. So you actually see that the difference between Rouge 1 and Rouge 2, there's a huge drop there. It's a lot easier to get a good Rouge 1 score than it is to get a good Rouge 2 score, but for some reason it's easier to get a Rouge L score than it is to get a Rouge 2 score. Yeah. I feel like in practice, Rouge L might be sequent like length two, and sometimes the three length might be easier than the two length, so I don't know. They seem similar enough that it's fine. Uh, best metric in every data set is marked in bold. Okay, here you have different training methods result on book summary where the average input length is 143k tokens oh shit entment is entity recall described a hierarchical summarization is a baseline where the chapter summaries are combined and condensed to form a book summary okay so hierarchical summarization you basically take the entire book break it up into chapters summarize each chapter and then uh, combine those summaries And if you do that, you get a score of 30 versus the unlimiformer. You get a score of 35. The random encoding training unlimiformer does the best. That's fucking weird. I guess this is actually more similar to hierarchical than we think it is, right? Because this one is actually, it's chunking the whole, the whole input and then randomly choosing within that chunk, so... Know, it's still a little bit weird that that's the best, but now here you're seeing a little bit more uh, re meaningful improvements here. 30, 37, that seems like more of a difference to me. But all of these numbers here, these are all kind of the same. 7.6, 7.7, 6.4, blah, blah, blah. 
it seems like Unlimited Former is slightly better than these other ones, right? It's consistently beating all these other baselines, but it's really not necessarily blowing them out of the water. <laughs> Wikisum, Wikipedia summarization. Primera. Let's learn more about this Primera model. Primera, pyramid-based masked sentence pretraining. Ah, uh, okay. So next token prediction, right, is a very common pre-training task for LLMs, and that is where you basically give the LLM every single word, and then you ask it to predict the next word, right? So you give it every single word in the sentence, and then you give it, you ask it to predict the next word. Mask sentence is different in that you give it the whole sentence, and you mask out a specific word, and then you say, okay, here's the whole sentence, find the specific masked word, right? So slightly different pre-training task, and Primera seems to be some version of mass sentence pre-training. So that's just Bert, probably. This is coming from the Allen AI Institute, which is, uh, Allen is one of the original Microsoft founders, and he took all his money and uh, made this Allen Institute for AI instead of uh, giving it to pharmaceutical companies so they could uh, give malaria drugs to kids in Africa, which is what uh, uh, Bill Gates used his money on. Okay. Previous work in data, data set analysis has found that strong signal for many generation tasks is concentrated on only part of the input or answering questions using a single paragraph. We observe this trend in Wikisum, a multi-document summarization data set where the inputs are all references for a Wikipedia article and the output summary is the intro paragraph of the article. baseline using only the first 1024 tokens, suggesting that the full input is not necessary or that the trans or that this transformer was pre-trained on a data set that included Wikipedia. I feel like this once we move into this world where uh, increasingly people are being more and more secretive about the data data sets that they train their models on and you're starting to get to a point at the scale where everyone's very hungry for every single piece of data. This, you're, you're gonna run into these issues where it's very likely that I feel like any LLM that you use and try to benchmark is going to already have been trained on Wikipedia, right? So then you're testing on your training data set, right? Which is kind of a, a big no-no because you're basically, you, the model memorized that, right? So I don't know, I think this this problem where the the testing data is leaked into the training data set is going to be more and more and more of a thing as these LLMs increasingly get trained on bigger and bigger amounts of the internet and uh, people get more secretive and they don't even tell you what it's trained on. And it's not even that, hey, well, this LLM is not trained on Wikipedia, but maybe it's trained on Reddit and half of the and a bunch of conversations in that Reddit data set are people talking about information that they learned from Wikipedia. So it's all coming from the same place, right? So... A lot of the same information. Have I checked the new OpenAI blog post? Yeah, I saw the new OpenAI blog post, the one about individual neurons and explainability. It's basically just like saliency maps, but um, my take on it was that it's not actually super great. What is it called? It's called uh, explaining uh, neurons, uh, OpenAI, something like that. Yeah. And they're basically saying, okay, we look at individual neurons and then we give you like this kind of saliency. And for those of you that don't know this saliency map, this is something that you can do in computer vision where you can basically say, hey, uh, here is, I don't know, a dog, what specifically in this image is causing this exact neuron to fire? And you can trace it back and say, okay, this is the part that it's quote unquote like paying attention to, right? So you can see which parts of 
the image are relevant to the actual final prediction. So here, brushing teeth, obviously the, the toothbrush in the hand and the mouth, cutting trees, the, the guy's face and the saw are very important. So this is basically the same thing, but applied to text. But I think it's important to realize that they even say it here. I think this is key here. Uh, neurons could be highly polysemantics representing many distinct concepts or could represent single, simple, single concepts that humans don't understand or have words for. And I think this is the key is that I think that the neurons inside GPT-4 are kind of like an alien intelligence, right? It's like, you can't really know what the fuck they're doing. And they're probably some weird poly, they're, they're highly polysemantic in a feature space that humans don't understand. Right? So yeah, many limitations. Like I said, I think that this is really just trying to pretend that they know what's going on, but in reality, it's like kind of meaningless because it's like, you're not really looking at the black box, you know? Uh, that's my take. Yeah, and it's kind of dystopian too because you can very clearly see that the whole point of that article is to convince like a bunch of boomer politicians that they understand what's going on inside their neural nets, right? Because the boomer politicians have kind of centered on this idea of like, oh, well, it's a black box and you don't know what's going on. So OpenAI doesn't want to get regulated. So they're like, okay, well, we're going to show you that we know what's going on. But really they don't. They're just saying that they know what's going on because they're afraid of the regulation, Right, so so many little things like that are kind of just a, a dog and pony show for people who don't actually understand the the technical details. So that article is not written for for you guys on the stream, right? That article is written for boomer politicians who are afraid of AI. Yeah. Uh, the encoding of the full input, data store construction, data store search. We benchmark the GPU time necessary. Benchmarking, let's go. Table six shows the relative cost for each method. The largest difference occurs during inference where the full input must be encoded. Yeah, so if you're comparing to a baseline where you only encode the first 1000 tokens, it's gonna be very bad in terms of total time required, right? Because in on Limiformer, you have to go through the entire book and encode the entire book, which is 112,000 tokens, versus your baseline, you're only encoding 1,000 tokens. Max data store size, so 350K. You can't fit one piece in that, not even close. So maximum data store size increases, the entity recall generally increases. So this is entity mentions recall, which is kind of like, does it say Harry Potter in the summary? And uh, obviously BART base gives you a score of 10 because BART base is only looking at the first 1000 tokens. So it says Harry Potter regardless at the data store size is kind of independent of that. And you can see that as you increase the size of the data store, right, the size of the amount of uh, embedding vectors that are coming out of the encoder, right, to 350,000 possible embedding vectors coming out of the encoder, then you can see that the entity mentioned recall increases. But I don't know enough about entity mentioned recall to know what the difference between a, an entity mentioned recall of 20 is versus an entity recall of 10 is. Like, I don't really have a good intuition about what that difference means, to be honest. And then this is time per example. So this is the actual time it takes to do it. So this is more GPU time. And then takes increasingly more time the larger your uh, data store is. Right, so if you have more and more vectors that you need to go in there and find the K nearest neighbors for, right? You have, if you have more potential neighbors to search through, it's gonna take longer. But the, the fact that it's sublinear is important, right? And you can, uh, 
you could thank the people at Facebook AI Research who do, who, who uh, open source that FAISS for the fact that this is sublinear, right? Relative GPU time. Holy shit, a 48 gigabyte A6000 GPU? That's fucking weird. You have a system that has more RAM or less RAM than GPU memory. Right, that's a weird kind of situation. Usually you have more RAM than GPU memory. Also, 16 core CPU is pretty shite, to be honest. Got 64s cores in these bad boys. Interesting that this recall does not grow monotonically. Yeah, right? Like, this is kind of weird, right? Why is 32K data store better than 100K data store? <laughs> You're right. That's kind of a weird situation. Retrieval augmented transformers. Interpolating large language models probabilities with nearest neighbors retrieval from a data store was originally proposed in this paper. Okay. To improve language modeling of decoder only models. Additional work in this space has explored adding structure to this data store, further increasing performance and improving efficiency. More recent work has focused on language modeling for long form text and applying retrieval augmented transformers to downstream classification tasks. Our work furthers this area by applying retrieval augmented methods to encoder decoder models and sequence generation tasks. You know what I'm thinking about? You could probably do retrieval augmented vision transformers, right? Think about how one of the biggest problems in computer vision right now is video, where you can deal with images, but as soon as you have video, the the amount of kind of input length is just way too huge, right? Because for, for every single second, you might have 30 frames, right? 30 images per second, and you have like a, a movie that's like two and a half hours long, that's just way more information. But what if you had a similar kind of approach? What if you encoded the entire movie and then used retrieval augmented approaches to summarize the movie visually. I don't exactly know, but applying this retrieval augmented stuff to vision transformers would be pretty cool. An orthogonal solution has emerged in the large language model literature. Change the transformer model such that time and space complexity is O n log n or O n. Yeah, this is the paper that I kind of vaguely recall that solved the fact that it was O of n squared, but most solutions achieve this reduction through sparsifying the attention mechanism. Here are all the different papers that sparsify, and I bet you that uh, GPT also does that. In other work, the attention mechanism either approximated or replaced entirely. So it seems like here uh, these techniques probably just project down to a lower dimensionality and do things there, right? I'm guessing by the use of the word linear here, linformer, linear transformers. In case of VITs, you don't consider time dimension, but you could think of each image as one continuing piece of the next image, right? Like vision transformers, vision transformer, Right, you're already chunking the image into a sequence, right? You're already taking the image, cutting it up into these little patches and then feeding them in as if they're part of a sentence. So you would just keep doing the same thing. You would just have the next frame in the video would start here and then you would have the next frame in the video and the next frame in the video. So it would basically be like a one very long book is the way that you could think of a vision transform or a vision transformer for uh, videos. Uh, these models are also limited to the maximum sequence length chosen during pre-training. Prior work has proposed several strategies for long document summarization. In particular, many methods select a subsection of, import, of input to summarize using TF-IDF. Smaller retrieval model, models or sentence similarity metrics 
an orthogonal approach to summarize chunks of the inputs, then combine and condense these subsummaries into a global summary. Other approaches, methods all suffer from cascading errors. If the initial trimming or chunk summarization steps remove important information, there's no way to recover. You also have all these extra hyperparameters of where do you chunk the information. And we finally get to it, conclusions. I feel like it should just be conclusion, right? We present on Limiformer, a method for augmenting pre-trained encoder decoders with an external data store to allow for unlimited length input. We demonstrate the usefulness of this approach for downstream sequence to sequence generation tasks, particularly long document summarization. We examine several training methodologies and demonstrate that these strategies significantly improve the base model. Expect that future work will further improve upon this performance. Information Retrieval Community has developed a wide variety of methods for improving retrieval, and we hope that the application of these methods will further improve the performance of retrieval augmented LLMs. We release code for easily injecting a Limiformer into any model. In our experiments, blah, 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 we only considered English and quote unquote CPU data stores are necessary for models with context windows larger than 2048 tokens as the phase GPU data store implementation does not support retrieving more than 2048 nearest neighbors. Huh. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. So the face data store, which is the exact code that they're using, right? Face is a Python code that actually runs C code behind it, but it only does 2000, so it only does up until here. I wonder if this is like, you can do some kind of like, almost like an octree kind of situation where you can store it in a tree and then in that way more efficiently search the space. I feel like there's probably people thinking about that. Using a CPU data store is many times slower than a GPU data store because of slower search and the need to transfer retrieval retrieved embeddings to the GPU. This is actually technically incorrect. There's no such thing as a CPU data store. The, the data store is not on your CPU. It's on your RAM. It's in your RAM memory. Your CPU does not have a data store. <laughs> the CPU is just the heart, you know, like it just pumps. It's just sitting there performing calculations. So people are already forgetting how computers work. Implementation details, wiki sum, evaluation, more tests, sample outputs. You think we'll get some data store accelerators like GPU? Probably. I think there will be hard, like specific uh, external hard drives that are that have like some kind of onboard GPU looking type thing that are specifically for uh, these type of retrieval based methods. There's a lot like if you're into hardware, there's this is like a great time to be into hardware because I feel like for a long time hardware was everybody knew what you needed to do, right? It was just like, oh, just make the CPUs faster, just make the GPUs bigger. But like now there's kind of an explosion and like a bunch, it's kind of like a Cambrian explosion in hardware is like one way that people describe it. But there's a lot of different techniques that all have very interesting and potentially promising approaches. So lots of hardware startups. And if you're into the hardware and like how the AI grows with the hardware and the best type of hardware for different types of AI systems, there's a lot there. I feel like the next 10 years are gonna be huge and the hardware 10 years from now is gonna look very different from the hardware that we're using now. Like even just the light, the like light computers, like that's absolutely like insane stuff. Like light based uh, GPU, optical chips. Yeah, like this stuff is fucking crazy. Like light intelligence. This stuff is still super early, but I don't know. Like I said, I feel like we're 
we're probably going to have very different hardware in uh, 10 years than we have now. Okay, so this is a summary of Brothers Karamazov, which I actually haven't read, so unfortunately, I'm not cool enough. I'm 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 not enough of a Lex Friedman to have read uh, the Brothers Karamazov. Maybe that <laughs> leads to some of you hating me, but I don't know. Just too too much, too intense for me. Okay, so. That was it, guys. So that was Unlimiformer, a long-range transformer with unlimited length input. This was a paper from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, kind of high-level summary, they're basically taking a encoder-decoder transformer and putting in a uh, retrieval uh, kind of database, right? So FAISS, which is the Facebook vector database, if you want to think of it that way. And largely what they're doing is... Where's the paragraph that I'm looking for? Right here. So they're taking uh, the, the choice of the embedding or the choice of the latent space that they're using to store all the information and retrieve the information is the uh, this, the encoder hidden state, which happens to be basically this as well, the decoder hidden state multiplied by the query weights and the key weights. So that's kind of the key insight of this paper is that you can take this right here and use it to find the K nearest neighbors of this right here, right? But pretty much everything else is pretty standard. Like they're basically just using face for text summarization. Um, yeah, maybe things that I didn't like about this paper was like the, these weird like uh, baselines they compared uh, to these things here, like these weird, like random, random nearest neighbors, or like, I don't know exactly what they were trying to say, but like the baselines were a bit weird. And I feel like they should have focused less on the performance. Like it seems like they, they were comparing to all these different other models when I feel maybe they would have benefited more with a section that kind of was more visual that like showed you exactly what, uh, what, nearest neighbors look like, right? Like whenever you're doing this kind of nearest neighbor search, what do you end up with, right? Like what are the types of things that uh, end up getting pulled out of that, right? I would have loved to see some kind of visualization showing me about that rather than kind of these big tables where they compare to Primera and like all these other random approaches that no one's ever heard of and no one cares about. So that would be my uh, only negative there, and then maybe the one thing that they said here where they, they call it CPU data store or CPU memory, where it's, it's, that's not actually what it is. It's a, it's in your RAM. But other than that, nice little cute paper, and yeah, hope it was kind of interesting. Holy shit, you guys are talking over here. Uh, NVIDIA said they wanted to accelerate AI by a million. How, how are they going to live up to it? Uh, crazy quantum entangled quantum entangled photons is crazy. Damn. Probably the lights compute. Thanks for the session. Thank you, Erlen, for visiting. Thank you, you guys, for uh, commenting. Thank you, Kalina and Lamb, for all the comments, all the nice, lively conversation. And see you guys tomorrow. I think I have another paper tomorrow. Let's see which one it is. I'm going to be talking about ImageBind. Ah, yes, this one's actually pretty cool. So ImageBind is a multimodal paper, but it's like multimodal on steroids. It's basically like, a, it's audio, text, image, video, thermal, IMU, depth. It's like basically every single modality you could possibly ever think of. And then they just train this giant pre-trained model on it. So interesting to see what happens there. So see you tomorrow. If not, have a great day. Have a great week. Have a great weekend. Have a great life. And see you guys.